All right, so, so moving on to the voir dire motion the other day, or the voir dire hearing in response to the Commonwealth's renewed motion for reciprocal discovery and motion to exclude defendant's expert, Dr. Marie Russell. So the Commonwealth was alleging violations of Rule 14's reciprocal discovery requirement, and the Commonwealth asked for exclusion of Dr. Russell. I did find and do find that there was a violation of the reciprocal discovery obligations of the defendants. I was looking for a remedy. You called it a sanction, Mr. Jackson, but I called it a remedy. And I did tell counsel, as you know, at Sidebar a couple of times, at least last week, that I did not want to exclude the testimony if I did not have to. We had the voir dire, and I'm satisfied that the voir dire provided the Commonwealth the information that the defense should have provided the Commonwealth. I am going to allow Dr. Russell to testify, but her testimony is very limited, and I think you even sort of acknowledged it the other day, Mr. Jackson. So she'll be allowed only to opine whether or not the marks on John O'Keefe's arm were the result of an animal attack. I find that she is a medical doctor. She's an experienced ER doctor, albeit several years ago since she's worked in that capacity, but that she does have special specialized knowledge in that field that may assist the jury in this regard. But she can't testify as an expert on police activity. There'll be none of that. And she will not be able to testify as to what the injuries are inconsistent with. She cannot testify that they're inconsistent with having been struck by a vehicle, road rash, scratches from broken glass or taillight matter or any other, anything else. So that's beyond the scope of which she can testify. The second part of the Commonwealth's motion, Commonwealth argued that they were not provided reciprocal discovery regarding the biomechanical engineers and others, but the, specifically a CCA, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Rentschler. And I do find, though I understand why the, the defense didn't respond, but it is a violation of Rule 14, so we had this voir dire. The Commonwealth was looking to see what each person did, their independent opinion, what their testimony would be, and whether they were qualified to render the opinions that they qualified. So from what I heard the other day, Dr. Wolf can testify to what he, his involvement. Dr. Rentschler, though, I have some concerns. It's clear to me that in Massachusetts, biomechanical engineers are not qualified to testify as to medical causation of an injury. Only an MD can do that. So I'm going to reserve ruling on the rest of his testimony, there are certain things he can testify, and I'll hear you again before he testifies next week. Let's just proceed with the trial today. So those are my rulings. Are they clear, Mr. Jackson? Yes, they are. Are they clear, Mr. Lally? Yes, Your Honor. All right, so are they ready to come in? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Taking you back to the other day, I have been showing you, you had testified about some <laughs> extraction reports that you had conducted from the various forensic extractions that you had done pertaining to both the defendant's phone and Mr. O'Keefe's phone, correct? Yes, sir. So we're showing you a document, I just review that with help when you finish. Okay. Do you recognize that, sir? Yes, it's uh, What do you recognize that to be? Sorry. Karen Reed's phone call logs. And that's specifically from January 28th and January 29th, is that correct? Yes, the 29th at 12.33 to 3.19 p.m. on the 29th. And just for ease of reference, does it sort of go in descending order as far as the earlier calls are on the last page and then the more recent calls are on the first page? Yes, that's correct. Showing you another document, sir. Do you recognize that? Yes. What do you recognize that to be? This is Karen Reed and Carrie Roberts' uh, call log. And that's an extraction report that you created from the defendant's phone, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, yes. Showing you another document, sir. Do you recognize that? Yes. What do you recognize that to be? This is the uh, chats from John O'Keefe and Chris Albert. And again, that's an extraction report that you created from Mr. O'Keefe's phone, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Showing you another document, sir. Do you recognize that, sir? Yes, this is uh, Karen Reed's the full chat report of everyone from the 29th on. Sir, I'm going to direct your attention to the exhibit before you that's now been marked as Exhibit 636. And if I could direct your attention to page 3. Who was that a conversation with? Laura Sullivan. Now that conversation essentially continues from page three to page six, is that correct? Yes, it does. So I'm gonna ask you, similar to what I asked you the other day, if you could read from that conversation in its entirety, indicating who's speaking, 
content of what's being said and the date and time associated with that message. Yes. First message is from Laura Sullivan at 12.45 p.m. on January 29th, 2022. Karen, it's Laura. Please call me. Karen says, hi, Laura, at 1.07 p.m. Karen then says, John passed away, 1.07 p.m. Laura, Karen, I'm shaking. I'm so sorry. At 1.07, Karen says, we found him outside in the snow at 5 a.m., 1.07 p.m. Laura, I can't stop crying, 1.07 p.m. again. Karen, thank you, 107. And Laura finally says, uh, why was he out there, 1.07 p.m.? Oh, sorry. Karen replies, uh, he left the party we were at. I don't know what time. I didn't even go in. I went to bed. That's at 1.08 p.m. Laura says, oh, my God, 108. Karen, my heart breaks for everyone at 1.09 p.m. Thank you, sir. So in those text messages, Ms. Sullivan, in the afternoon of the 29th, she indicates to Ms. Sullivan that they located Mr. O'Keefe around 5 a.m. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Now, sir, if I could direct your attention to page 28 through 29. Who's that a conversation with? This is uh, Karen Reed and Joe O'Keefe. 28 through 29 of this exhibit occur in the early morning hours of uh, January 29th, correct? Yes, that's correct. And if you could, sir, again, uh, please read as far as who's speaking, uh, what they're saying, and what date and time uh, these are being sent. Yes. So, uh, Karen Reed to John O'Keefe at 12.55 a.m. on the 29th. I'm going home, followed by I'll see you later. At 1.02 a.m., she texts John again saying, your kids are cucking alone. And at 1.04 a.m., she says, I'm back in Mansfield. The kids are home alone. I'm showing you two documents. You recognize each of those documents, sir? Yes, one is a Karen Reed call log report. Just want to confirm which, which one this is. For John O'Keefe, and then John O'Keefe's full call log report on the 29th. Now, sir, if I could direct your attention to the defendant, Ms. Reed's call log report, specifically, if I could draw your attention to what's been, they're, they're enumerated as far as certain box numbers, correct? One through whatever it goes on the last page? Yes. If I could direct your attention to boxes 113 and 114, Okay. See those entries, sir? Yes. Now, as far as the time uh, related mm -hmm. to box 113 and 114, what are the time stamps associated with that? Uh, 129, 2022 at 1236 uh, a.m., 41 seconds, and then another one at 1236 and 10 seconds a.m. on the 29th. And is there any indication uh, within that uh, report as far as whether or not those calls are answered, those calls are missed, those calls are rejected? What's, what's listed there? It says answered. With regard to that 1236 time, uh, from your review of both the defendant's phone and Mr. O'Keefe's phone, is there a, a voicemail that the defendant left Mr. O'Keefe at that time frame? Uh, there was a voicemail at 1237 a.m. These ones here, it looks like they're three seconds and five seconds long. And they're listed as answered, is that correct? That is correct. Now, sir, if I could turn your attention over to Mr. O'Keefe's call report, and specifically, I'm going to ask you to direct your attention to what's uh, been labeled as box number 134 and then 134 uh, with the one in parentheses following that. Okay. And do you see those entries, sir? Yes. And what is the uh, date and time associated with those entries in Mr. O'Keefe's records? Uh, his records shows uh, number 134 is 1236, uh, nine seconds uh, on the 29th, and then 134 with the one in the parentheses, 1236 and nine seconds as well. But call duration, zero seconds. And as far as any indication on those calls, as far as whether they're answered, they're missed, they're rejected, or what are they listed as? Uh, there's nothing. The, also, 133 is the same call, uh, and that, that one says missed, and it's at the same timestamp of 1236 and nine seconds. So the same call around the same time frame shows up in Mr. O'Keefe's report as missed and shows up in the defendant's report as answered, correct? That is correct. And that is around the time that the defendant is calling uh, the victim repeatedly and leaving voicemails on Mr. O'Keefe's phone. Yes, that's correct. Now, Trooper Garino, you conducted an analysis of both uh, the defendant's phone and Mr. O'Keefe's phone, correct? That is correct. And from your analysis of that phone, uh, were you able to determine uh, approximately how many calls uh, occurred from the defendant's phone to Mr. O'Keefe's phone from the time period shortly after 12.30 a.m. Uh, to the time period shortly after 6 a.m.? Uh, there was over 50. I think it was 53 or 55. But. And uh, any of those calls from your review of those records indicate any uh, sort of conversation as far as duration, as far as being labeled as answered, anything to that effect? That Mr. O'Keefe actually picked up the phone and spoke to Ms. Reed? Yes. Uh, no. 
Now, with regard uh, to those phone calls from the defendant to Mr. O'Keefe, what, if anything, did you find from Mr. O'Keefe's phone in relation to uh, voicemails left by the defendant? Uh, there were, uh, excuse me, eight voicemails on Mr. O'Keefe's phone uh, from the 29th till the phone was discovered, all from Ms. Reed, no one else. You recognize that? Yes. What do you recognize that to be? It's the uh, John O'Keefe voicemails uh, from Karen Reed on his phone. From that period that we were just speaking about on January 29th? Yes, that's correct. Sir, from your review of the defendant's phone, uh, before we get to those, uh, from your review of the defendant's phone, uh, what, if anything, were you able to observe or ascertain that the defendant's phone did at approximately 12.36 a.m.? So, uh, by looking at uh, the timeline in the phone, we were able to see that Ms. Reed's phone auto-connected to John O'Keefe's Wi-Fi at his house at 12.36 a.m. Um, we know this because it's a password-protected uh, access to the phone, so you would have to know the password to get into this uh, Wi-Fi network. And that would be the home at 1 Meadows Avenue, correct? Yes, that's correct. And, Your Honor, with the court's permission, if we could uh, publish uh, each of the eight voicemails uh, to the jury. Okay. Are we going to hear which time each one is? Yes, Your Honor. And, Trooper Greeno, again, similar to the other messages, just uh, for point of reference, the earliest of the voicemails is the last in the list, and the most recent is at the top of the list. Is that correct? Yes. Now, as far as this first voicemail, uh, what time did this occur? 12.37 a.m. And the, with the court's permission, if I could play that for the jury. Yes. <laughs> Trooper Garino, what time is the second message? Trooper Garino, with reference to the third message, what time is that received? 12.59. And again, when I say received by Mr. O'Keefe's phone, is that correct? That's the timestamp of, of the voicemail in his phone, yes. And Ms. Gilman, if you could, with reference to that third message. John, I'm telling you, fucking kid. Nobody knows what the fuck you want. You fucking pervert. Now, the... Fourth message, Trooper Garino, what time was that received by uh, Mr. O'Keefe's phone? 1.02 a.m. That was it. So can we just turn the air conditioner off for just a second, please? So you just played it? Yeah, Your Honor, there was no... Uh, Content. They were just a like a one second long uh, message. And Trooper Garino, with regard to the fifth message, what time was that received by Mr. O'Keefe's phone? Uh, one, two, three, seven, four, two, fifty, one, two, one, eleven a.m. Yeah, it's one in the morning. I'm with your fucking niece and nephew. You fucking pervert. You're fucking pervert. In the sixth message, sir, what time was that received by Mr. O'Keefe's phone? 1.18 a.m. Come in if you could. John, I'm going home. I cannot be just that you need. I need to go home. You, you are fucking using me right now. You're fucking another girl. You sleeping next to me. You're a fucking loser. Fuck yourself. The uh, seventh message, sir, what time was that received by Mr. O'Keefe's phone? 5.23 a.m. Just gentlemen, if you could. The last and eighth message, sir, what time was that received by uh, Mr. O'Keefe's phone? 6.08 a.m. Just gentlemen, if you could. I mean, if you could pause there for one second, I'm sorry. With respect to this message uh, received on Mr. O'Keefe's phone at 6.08 a.m., uh, from your knowledge of the investigation, where was the defendant uh, who was, was with her or around her at the time of this message at 6.08 a.m.? Uh, Jen McCabe, Carrie Roberts, 
during the message, you can hear someone on the phone with 911. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Gilman, if you could. turn the air conditioning back on. Thank you very much. Now, Trooper Garino, in addition to the 53 phone calls that you testified about the defendant made to Mr. O'Keefe uh, from that time frame uh, following 1230 a.m. to approximately 6, um, just past 6 a.m., did you note uh, any other calls uh, to a contact uh, listed within the defendant's phone as mom? Yes. And when were those calls uh, placed? I uh, believe there's one at one... 10-ish in the morning. I forget the exact time stamp. Uh, there's also one at around 4.40 in the morning and then a 4.42, a, around, right around 4 in the morning. Two of them, the first two weren't answered, and then the third phone call was answered. Now, <clears throat> with respect to uh, Ms. Reed's phone from that same time period, what, if any, phone calls did you observe to a contact listed in the defendant's phone as dad? Uh, it's the same number, so when I looked at it in one report, it showed as dad, and then when I looked at it 
in Celebrate, it came up as mom, so I don't know how it's attributing. Maybe she has it listed twice. I never looked at her actual phone, so this is what the extraction is showing me. Now, sir, you testified the other day that upon your review of the defendant's extraction reports, you were not able to determine that there were no listed uh, GPS locations for the defendant's phone? Correct. Uh, like routes or anything like that. And that was because it was turned off uh, in the phone, is that correct? That would, would lead me to believe, yes, that location services are turned off, so. So, so no guess. What, do you, what can you tell us about that? Well, for GPS coordinates and location services on, that's what would get us locations in the phone. So if they're not there, they could be turned off. Objection. Now, with respect to Mr. O'Keefe's phone, um, what of any analysis uh, with respect to GPS uh, and or health data? Well, let me ask you this. Is for, from your training experience uh, and uh, the, your casework uh, with respect to um, forensic analysis of electronic devices, uh, what is health data in a, in a cell phone? How is that recorded? And, and what, if anything, can that tell you? Okay. Uh, so in, in an iPhone, you can have health data. Uh, uh, to use that health data, uh, the phone, if you don't have an iWatch paired to it, is basically just a high-tech pedometer. It's just every time you move the phone, it's going to track steps, and that's if you have it turned on. If you have the iWatch on, it'll get uh, beats per minute, and you get a much more robust uh, health data from it. Now, with respect um, to the health data and with respect to the GPS location uh, for Mr. O'Keefe's phone, um, initially, what, if any, uh, sort of uh, analysis did you do with respect to that? Uh, so. We checked his native locations. At 1219, uh, the phone is, well, I should say this, at 1212 in his location shows that he's at the Waterfall Bar. The next set of locations shows he's uh, at Denham Street by Cedarcrest, and then Waze is activated for 34 Fairview. So, and then it shows me his entire route to 34 Fairview. And what is Waze, sir? Uh, Waze is similar to Apple Maps. It is a GPS program that, you know, punch in like a Garmin type thing. If I could take you back just for a moment, just to the, the health data from the, uh, the Cellbrite extraction that you did. Um, specifically, you looked at data from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. on January 29, 2022. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And as far as the health data was concerned, uh, there were some entries from 12, 11 a.m. to 12, 32 a.m. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And can you describe to the jury sort of what you observed and, and what, if any, significance those entries had to you as far as the health data was concerned? Yeah, so uh, the health data shows, um, like I said, the phone is basically a high-tech pedometer. If you're moving it around, it's going to think you're taking steps when you might not actually be walking. His health data showed while he's driving that he's traveling and taking steps. So um, I need a foundation. Regrino, over the course, uh, you became, over the course of this investigation and your analysis, you became aware of, of other witness statements, uh, surveillance video, uh, things of that nature, uh, as to Mr. O'Keefe's whereabouts. Uh, from approximately 12 a.m. to uh, at least 1 a.m., is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and you're aware of uh, around the time, just past 6 a.m., uh, when you're... Right, right. So let's hear the question first. Well, cool. that's my answer. Go ahead, Mr. Adams. You're aware of the time being just past 6 a.m. that you've already testified to as to uh, when uh, Mr. O'Keefe was discovered and 911 was called? Yes, that's correct. So, sir, with respect to, again, that time period starting at 12, 11 a.m., uh, what, if anything, did you observe uh, with respect to the health data of Mr. O'Keefe as signified within the phone? Uh, so it marks when he's taking steps, ascending, uh, the, yeah, ascending stairs, uh, and distance traveled. And so from that period of 1211 to 1232, there were essentially uh, four time periods that you delineated. Uh, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And uh, do you remember the precise times and sort of the distance traveled uh, within those time frames? I don't remember the precisely uh, off the top of my head. Your Honor, with uh, the court's permission, may the trooper refer to his report just for yes, those numbers? Do you have it with you, Trooper? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. And, sir, if you could uh, just uh, list for the jury what you found. Yes. Uh, so at 1211 uh, and 9 seconds in the morning uh, to 1221 and 5 seconds on the 29th, uh, it shows that he's taking 170 steps going 99.6 meters or 326 feet. At Sorry. 1221 in 10 seconds to 1224 in 22 seconds. It shows 80 steps and 87.74 meters or 287 feet. At 1221, 14 seconds uh, 
to 12, 24, and 37 seconds, uh, it stated ascending, descending full three floors. And then at 12, 31, 56 to 12, 32, 16 in the morning, 36 steps, 25.46 meters or 85 feet. Now, sir, with respect to what's listed as steps, uh, does that indicate from based on your training experience and familiarity with this sort of health data, what, if anything, does that tell you as to whether or not the person with the phone is physically taking steps? That's not the case. What is the case? Uh, like I said, the phone has internal measures. Uh, no objection. Uh, the phone has internal measures in it. Like I said, it's basically a pedometer. So the movements of the phone, the distance traveled, it's going to register as steps. You don't have to physically be walking and moving the phone for it to register movements just waving it around and then could potentially cause it to think you're walking and moving. You mentioned that uh, from your review of Mr. O'Keefe's phone, you uh, indicated there was a way search for 34 Fairview Road, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And if you could just explain to the jury sort of what is, what is Waze and, and what, what kind of information are you looking at here? Uh, Waze is a GPS program. So you put your address you're looking to go to, it's gonna tell you the fastest route, where the police are, et cetera. And when that uh, way search was conducted, is there a precise time pursuant to your review of Mr. O'Keefe's phone associated with that way search? Uh, yes, it was at 12.20 in the morning. And so from all of those steps and everything uh, that you, uh, if Mr. O'Keefe is, is searching for 34 Fairview Road improbably, he's not at 34 Fairview Road, is that correct? That is correct. Now, with respect um, to the location, uh, can you describe to the jury, uh, are you familiar with the term based on your training experience uh, known as native locations? Yes. And can you explain to, uh, to the jury what that is? Uh, so native locations on an iPhone, the way it pulls GPS data, it uses satellite, Wi-Fi signal, Bluetooth, uh, location services on apps. It takes all that data and uses it into, to get you the best location of where you are, unlike where you'd have like a handheld car-mounted Garmin GPS that's just using strictly satellite. Now, from your review of that data, when that wave search is conducted at approximately 12.20 a.m., where is Mr. O'Keefe uh, physically located at that, at that time? Uh, the vehicle, uh, or whatever they're in, is uh, by 138 Dedham Street. They had already passed Cedar Crest Road. And from review of that native location data, uh, what time does uh, the phone arrive in the area of 34 Fairview Road? Uh, 12.24 a.m. Now, the... Next entry, as far as the location data, when is that and where is it indicating that the phone is at that point? Uh, it shows me it's there the entire night, right in between 32, 34 Fairview. So and 32, 34 Fairview, that sort of intersection of those two residences, uh, if you know, where is that in relation to where Mr. O'Keefe was found uh, just after 6 a.m. in the morning? I was only going by the photos that Sergeant Good had taken and from the Canton PD cruiser cam, but that area would be within three feet, give or take, of the uh, area where the, the GPS signals all plot for the rest of the night. Now, Trooper Greeno, you testified the other day to a, uh, a tool that you use called Axiom, is that correct? Yes. And with regard to the location data uh, in the tool of Axiom, uh, what, if anything, can you tell the jury as far as uh, how that works and, and how accurate it is? So, like Celebrate, um, Axiom will also show the native locations in an iPhone. They're able to display the uh, range of accuracy in meters and then also uh, the speed of the phone in meters per second. Were you able to uh, ascertain uh, from using the Axiom tool and uh, the location data for Mr. O'Keefe's phone as far as its speed in meters per seconds at 12.25.36 a.m.? I was. I don't remember it uh, off the top of my head. Your Honor, with the court's permission, may the uh, trooper refer to his Thank report you. for the numbers. Go ahead. It's uh, 0.6346 meters per second and a 16.75 meter uh, lever of accuracy, so at, at about 54 feet uh, measure of accuracy. Sir, if you could, just based on your training experience and your use uh, familiarity with this Axiom uh, tool, uh, for the record, that's AXIOM, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So as far as that... Um, degree of certainty or accuracy with regard to the measurement. Can you speak a little bit about that and explain that to the jury, how that, how that works and what that means? Yeah. So, uh, you know, as I said, the iPhone tries to use multiple things to get you the best uh, area of location where you're at. I can tell from personal experience that being at 34 Fairview, it's at the bottom, Fairview, where 34 is it on Fairview, it's at the bottom of a hill and it's also at the bottom of Cedar Crest where they sort of intersect. Um, 
that area there has many hills. So the GPS signal can weaken due to uh, natural uh, landscape, uh, buildings, um, weather, uh, multiple faction, uh, factors. And as far as the degree of accuracy, what, if anything, does that tell you in regard to the location of the phone in reference to that degree of accuracy? So it, it plots a point where it believes you are, and then the degree of accuracy says you could be in this bubble, but if it's way outside or way far away, it, it's all going to show by how well the signal strength is to the satellite. So, like I said, if it's a poor signal, it's going to blow out. It's going to show you could be in this giant circle. But as it gets better accuracy, it's going to shrink back down. It's going to say, no, nope, you're right about here. And, and to that point, or to elucidate that point, here. And, and to that point, uh, or to elucidate that point that you were just speaking on, we'll get to this more in depth in a second. But at some point in 2023, did you go to 34 Fairview Road to conduct some uh, GPS mapping? Yes, I did. And when you were in that area of 34 Fairview Road, what, if anything, did you observe with reference to uh, satellite connection, cell phone connection, things of that nature, as far as the strength of the signal? Um, so on my way to work, I actually drive Fairview quite often. And being there in person with my phone, I'll go from four or five bars of service. When I'm there, it's one or two. So that tells me that strength of signal there is not great. Now, turning back to this uh, location data from Mr. O'Keefe's phone, uh, you mentioned that it's, uh, you testified that at 1225-36 a.m. Uh, it has a certain accuracy and it was traveling a certain speed, correct? Yes. Now, what if any speed is recorded in this location data between that 1225 a.m. and 615-36 uh, a.m.? Um, Your Honor, may I uh, just yes. read? Thank you. What, what time frame uh, exactly are you looking for? What I'm asking is what if any speed was recorded by the location data between uh, that first 1225-36 a.m. and 6.15-36 a.m.? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking for before that. No, there's no real speed registered until the phone is found the next morning. And so that would be at the 6.15-36 a.m. time frame. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And what speed is recorded at that time at 6.15-36 in the morning? Uh, it shows 0.24. Uh, meters per second for speed, and then uh, with an accuracy rating of 7.58 meters, which is 24 feet. Thanks. Now, sir, if I could turn your attention to uh, May 8, 2023, uh, where did you go uh, with relation to this investigation on that day? I went to 34 Fairview. And who, if anyone, went with you? Trooper Proctor. Now, what was the purpose of, of going to 34 Fairview Road on that day to May of 2023? Uh, we wanted to take measurements of where uh, Officer O'Keefe's body was found, and then basically a diagonal straight line to the door, how the distance that would be. And what, if any, <clears throat> tools uh, did you bring with you, and what, if anything, did you use uh, uh, in the course of this analysis on this day? Uh, so I loaded in the GPS points into a program that the CERT team uses called SARTOPO. It's a GPS mapping uh, program that you can view through an app. So uh, that way I was able to see exactly where I was via the app. Uh, we also used a one of the big long tape measures that's in like the big thing that would get us, you know, from where we believed his body was to the front door. And from that, as far as the determination of, of where Mr. O'Keefe's uh, body was located, what, if anything, did you use to determine that? Uh, as I said before, the uh, photos and video from Sergeant Good of KNPD and the KNPD cruiser cam video. So the cruiser cam video that uh, from Officer Saras cruiser, is that correct? Yes, that's correct the one that shows uh, where Ms. O'Keefe's body is when Officer Sarif arrives on scene, correct? That is correct. Now, <clears throat> with regard to uh, those particular GPS points, what time frame did you start as far as your, your mapping was concerned? We took the last, uh, well, we mapped the entire route, so the, at the Waterfall Bar and then on from their drive on Dedham Street down to 34 Bearview. And as far as these locations, how were they measured uh, as, as far as what, what kind of measurements were you using in order to uh, plot those points? Uh, we loaded into uh, Google Maps and just able to show it with a KMZ file to show exactly where he went. And so, so what I'm asking is as far as the GPS locations that you were recording, was those, how were those measured as, as far as longitude, latitude? Is that how they were measured? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, latitude and longitude. And you started uh, with Mr. O'Keefe uh, at the Waterfall Bar in Canton. Uh, what time was that, if you know? Uh, 12, 12 a.m. was the last point. And then that time frame when uh, Mr. O'Keefe's native locations are putting him in the area of 34 Fairview Roads, uh, when was that first time frame? The time he arrives? Yes. Yeah, about 12, 24, I forget the seconds, but 12, 24 a.m. Now, eventually, when you had all of these uh, points as far as the direction of travel, uh, location data, all of those things. What, if anything, were you then able to do with those GPS locations? 
uh, cross-referenced them with his health data and also mapped it out to see exactly where he would be. Now, with respect uh, to the data that you were able to recover, if you could uh, describe to the jury sort of the path of travel, starting with the waterfall as far as uh, where Mr. O'Keefe's phone was, where it traveled in it, and where you noted it at various uh, time points along that sequence. Okay. Uh, so, as I said, 12-12, uh, it's at the waterfall bar. Then there's a seven-minute uh, break in location data. Uh, when it, the phone comes back up with location data at 12-19, as I said, he's by Dedham Street and Cedar Crest Road. At 138 Dedham Street, right around there, 12.20 a.m., uh, 34 variables put into Waze. He then seeds down Dedham Street, takes a left onto Oakdale Road, that goes to the end of Oakdale, takes a left onto Maplecroft. Uh, as he's going by Maplecroft and Pinecone Road, uh, right around 12.22 and 14 seconds, was a data point listed that he's ascending, descending the stairs. Uh, so he's over a half a mile away from 34 Fairview at this point. They go down Maplecroft, take a right onto Cedar Crest, all the way down Cedar Crest. They do not turn onto third, uh, Fairview Road. They, it goes by Fairview, does a three-point turn or turns around somehow, and then goes back to Fairview and takes a right, uh, where it finally stops between 34 and 32 Fairview. So at the time that that, um, that health data is being recorded. Again, you cross-reference the GPS data with the health data from Mr. O'Keefe's phone, correct? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> and so at the time that the phone um, has that recording in the health data, descending, uh, and is it ascending or descending, or how does that read in the health data? Uh, I have in my report, and that's what's copied from the thing. It's ascending slash descending stairs. And at that point in time, cross-referencing that health data with the GPS location, where physically uh, is Mr. O'Keefe's phone at that particular time frame? Uh, Maplecroft by Pinecone Road, right at that intersection. And has Mr. O'Keefe's phone arrived or uh, been in the area as far as the GPS, specifically of 34 Fairview Road? At that time? Yes. No, not at all. And so from the GPS locations that you observed of the defendant's phone initially, the phone passes by Fairview Road and then reverses direction to come back, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then as far as between 12.25 uh, a.m. and 6.15 a.m., there's no movement of that phone, correct? Yes. What, if any, movement did you observe uh, following 12.25 uh, a.m. until the period of 6.15 a.m.? None, until it was found at 6.15. Now, you met, mentioned that you uh, took a tool and you did some uh, measurements as well, is that correct? Yes. And were you able to uh, ascertain then some GPS locations for where, where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found? Yes. And what, if any, measurements Excuse me, the accuracy of uh, those uh, GPS measurements and latitude and longitude, what was the accuracy of that? Uh, so, uh, can I read the exact thing? Okay. All right. Uh, so, from 12.25 and 30 seconds to about 12.35 and 36 seconds, uh, the GPS accuracy uh, is tight on them for the first few seconds and then blows out and encompasses pretty much the neighborhood. There are 34, Fairview, 32, 31, and I'll read the exact. It's at 12.25 and 30 seconds. It has a 33-meter degree of accuracy, which is about 100 feet. Uh, that area encompasses 32, 34, and 31 Fairview. 12, 25, 31, it's 200 foot uh, measure of accuracy. Uh, that hits 31, 32, 34 Fairview. Uh, basically, the whole, all the houses around. Uh, 32 seconds, uh, it shrinks back down to 95 foot uh, level of accuracy, uh, hitting 32, 34 Fairview. And the front yard at 31. At 33 seconds, it's 88 feet. Again, sh shrinking back in as the signal gets better. Covering 32, 34, Fairview. Uh, 72 feet at 34 seconds, 59 feet at 35 seconds, and then 52 feet at 36 seconds. So, as I said, signal weakens, it blows out, and then as the signal gets stronger, it shrinks back in. The GPS coordinates themselves are all still right where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found. And so as far as, uh, if I can take you back just for a second, the initial GPS coordinates that you marked as far as where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found, how accurate uh, was that measurement as far as to itself where it was? Uh, from what we had and then where we marked from, we believe we're in about three feet because standing there, even with the app, it's not perfect. I'm not getting a direct saying that I'm right on it. So we believe we're within about three feet of exactly where he was found. And from that air distance of within three feet of where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found, how far was that, or how far did you measure that to be from the front door of 34 Fairview Road? 
uh, in a direct straight line to the front door, uh, 72 feet, not accounting the stairs. Now, from your review of that data that you were talking about from that 1235, 1235 and 30, excuse me, 1225 and 30 seconds through 1225 and 36 seconds when it fluctuates, um, what time period of, of that uh, is, what time period of any of the times that you observed uh, is it possible that John O'Keefe was actually anywhere near 34 Fairview Road, the house? Objection. Ask it differently. Sure. Within those winning uh, circles uh, of GPS data that you were talking about, what time period did those encompass the actual inside of the residence of 34 Fairview Road? It's about three seconds where it actually encompasses the inside of Fairview. That fourth second, it's right on the edge of the corner of the house. And then the fifth and sixth second, um, they're just showing the front yard. In that time period, as far as uh, that time period, as far as uh, those uh, GPS data from those circles, um, with reference to following time periods after those, um, what if any, based on your training experience, what if any opinions were you able to draw from sort of that data? Um, I, so he would have to go from the GPS point that's listed. It would take him, you know, a second and a half to get to the house and then a second and a half back where his body was found, where his phone was underneath him. That would, he'd have to go about 48 feet a second when I did a velocity calculation, which is about 32 miles an hour, a second to the house, a second back. There's, there was no GPS points ever showing inside the home, the backyard of the home. Uh, there's no Latin long listed. It's just the degree of accuracy from the GPS signal. It was 72 feet uh, from where Mr. O'Keefe's body was found to the front door of 34 Fairview Road in order for him to be inside of 34 Fairview Road during any of those measured time frames, he would have to travel objection. 72 feet and one and the a half. Objection sustained. The objection sustained. Okay. Sir, again, if I could ask you the uh, <clears throat> from the Mr. O'Keefe's um, health date as far as his uh, specific physical location at the time that it indicates ascending and descending, how far away from 34 Fairview Road was it when it registered that? It's over a half mile away, so Maplecroft at Pinecone Road. In your opinion, sir, at any point in time uh, from the data that you reviewed, uh, did Mr. O'Keefe enter 34 Fairview Road? I'll sustain the objection. May I approach on? Yes. So I'm showing you a, a series of documents that I review those and look up when you're finished. Okay. You recognize those, sir? Yes. And what do you recognize those to be? Uh, these are the plotted points I did through Google Earth, uh, the maps, and then the, through LexisNexis, the track system, the uh, GPS range and coordinates. And the LexisNexis track system, if you could explain uh, just a bit to the jury as far as what that is and how it's used to create these documents before you. It's uh, similar to that Sartopo program I used. Uh, it's, it's a desktop-based GPS program. Uh, you put the points in and then it will map them out uh, and create, uh, a, like I said, a KMZ file for you so you can load it into Google Earth. May I approach, John? Yes. I'm up to teaching. Okay. Objection. Thank you. 638. May I return to the witness, John? Yes. With the court's permission, may I publish it? Yes. Uh, Ms. Gilman, if you could take that down. May I have a moment, John? Yes. Sorry. May I stand up? No, of course I can. In fact, Trooper, if you're more comfortable standing for some of your testimony, you certainly can. Now, Trooper, there should be a, a laser pointer up on the stand before you. Uh, if you could, first of all, let me just ask, do you recognize what's up on the screen now as the next exhibit? Yes. And again, if you could just explain to the jury sort of what we're looking at in this slide and then using that laser pointer, if you could, uh, direct the jury's attention to what, if anything, of significance you have in this particular slide. So uh, I took an overview of uh, the town of Can. Uh, so this here is the GPS route and then down over, I can't barely see, let me just look on the map here. It's not much better. Uh, uh, waterfall bar is right up, uh, I can't really tell honestly from this, but it's uh, on Washington Street, That's uh, it's down here, I'm sorry. That's why I included uh, a, an overview of everything so you could see the, the full range from the time period with that GPS locations. Keep your voice up. I don't know if this is gonna work any better, but if I could ask if we could turn the lights back on just so the witness can see sure. what's before him. And then with the court's permission, I think the, the map is still viewable to the jury and now the witness can actually see the exhibit. Can everybody see it? So again, sir, Trooper, I'm sorry. Now with uh, visible before you, if you could just uh, indicate again what we're looking at in this. Yep, 
Um, so when you zoomed in, it actually closed it out, but it's down over here is the waterfall bar. Uh, there's a couple of points there listed. And then right around here uh, is when the GPS tracks go and their route once Waze is activated down to 34 Fairview. Uh, there is a zoomed in version of by Fairview. Uh, so, yep. so this is the track. Uh, this one shows the 1222, um, yeah, 1222 and 14 second uh, GPS point where the, right here where the little arrow is. That's exactly where they were uh, when the phone is registering the ascending, descending stairs, like listed in Celebrate. Yes, so this is where they were with the ascending, descending stairs. Uh, they would go continue down through this little piece here, take the right onto Cedar Crest. They continue down Cedar Crest, missing Fairview right here, and then turn back around and then come to the house. And this gentleman, if I could have the next slide. And Trooper, uh, what are we looking at in this slide, and specifically if you could explain to the jury as far as the blue circle if you could look this way, please. Attached to the Lexus Nexus tracks, uh, if you can explain to the jury what that is and what that is. Yeah, so uh, as I said, we loaded this in through Lexus Nexus and it gave us the GPS points for, came, uh, for the route. Uh, the point is 348. I just wanted to double check. Yeah, point 348 is at 1225 and 30 seconds. The blue circle is the uh, estimated range, so how well the signal for the GPS is. Uh, and 34 Fairview is right pretty much by that L. Yeah, there we go. Sure, but it's essentially the same image, a little bit closer with, without the graphic as far as the Lexus Nexus. That's correct. This is 34 Fairview right here, 32. And then again, this is where all the points are for the duration. As far as the, the blue circle that's up on the screen, what does that represent as far as this particular point in time for this GPS point 348 at 1225 and 30 seconds? Yes, this is the. As I said before, the, the range of accuracy um, due to satellite strength. So it, as I said, it, it blows out as it loses strength and then we'll come back in as it gets better uh, signal. If I have the next slide. So what's up on the screen? What are we looking at this as far as uh, 1225-31? Same area where the 348 is. This is part 351. Uh, again, as you can see, strength of signal blows out and encompasses almost the whole neighborhood. The, of all the houses around. And Ms. Gilman, if I could have the next slide. Again, sir, is this the same GPS point of 351, uh, number 351 at 1225 and 31 seconds? Yes, it is. And if you could, again, just explain the jury what we're looking at in the slide. Yeah. Uh, same thing, just the degree of accuracy and the strength of the satellite signal to uh, Officer O'Keefe's phone. Again, sir, if you could explain to uh, the jury what we're looking at in, in this slide of what time frame we're talking about. Yep, yeah. this is point 349. Uh, 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 32 seconds again latitude and longitude they're all right in the same area uh, and that's that. Ms. Gilman, if I could have the next slide. Again, Trooper Carino, is this the same GPS plotting point in the same time frame of 12, 25, 32 seconds? Yes, it is. It's in, uh, in particular in relation to the, the earlier slides uh, with reference to the accuracy that you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, the accuracy blew out as it lost signal and now it's now shrinking back in uh, as accuracy gets better. Sir, what GPS point or what uh, time frame are we looking at in this particular slide? This is uh, 1225 and 33 seconds. Uh, again, same area, lat long, uh, right in the yard of 34 Fairview. And Mr. Gilman, if I could have the next slide. Trooper Carino, is this the same GPS point of number 348 and 1225 and 33 seconds? That's correct. And again, uh, if you could explain to the jury as far as the accuracy and, and what we're looking at in this one. Yep, so the... I believe they actually wasn't that much of a drop off. Yeah, so it went from 88 feet to 72 feet. So the circle still doesn't look like it really shrank much. Ms. Gilman, if I could have the uh, next slide, please. And again, Trooper, what, uh, what time frame and what GPS point are we looking at in this one? This is 1225 and 34 seconds. Uh, again, same thing right there, the corner of uh, 34 Fairview and 32 Fairview. That's correct. Yep. Uh, so 34 Fairview is here. So as I said, this uh, point here is the last one where it sort of cuts out the little corner of the house, but everything's still showing directly. This is where it's believed uh, to be. Well, what GPS point or what time are we looking at in this one, sir? This one's uh, 35 seconds, uh, 1225, 35 seconds. Same thing. Again, GPS point still saying it's right there where his body was, but again, it dropped from 
72 feet of back street down to 59 feet. So it's going to show the outside only of the house. Yeah, point, is that correct? That is correct. And again, sir, same GPS point at number 346 and same time at 1225.35. Is that correct? That is correct. Mr. Chairman, if I could have the next slide. This slide, what This is uh, GPS point number 345, and it's 1225 and 36 seconds. Again, showing that the signal strength has, again, grown and gotten better. As far as grown and gotten better, what, what accuracy or what degree of accuracy uh, in, in feet are we looking at in this? This is within 52 feet. And this gentleman, lastly, from this group, uh, the next slide. Again, sir, this is the same as the previous slide, GPS point number 345, 1225 and 36 seconds. That's correct. And again, if you could, using the laser pointer, just to yeah. illustrate to the jury what we're looking at. Yeah, uh, as I said, uh, there's no any plotted points anywhere other than right in this area for the rest of the night. This is where it stays, and there's varying degrees of accuracy, but it's there's nothing ever showing it anywhere else uh, in that neighborhood. May I approach, John? Yes. I just gave it back. Um, if you could take a look at that and look up when you're finished. Yes. Do you recognize that, sir? Yes, this is a second map I created. Uh, with the cell bright locations from their native locations. The previous one was from Axiom. So I used both programs to map it. Why did you use both programs, sir? As I said, um, Axiom showed uh, movement and degree of accuracy where cell bright doesn't. It just gives you the native locations. Uh, I used two programs so I can corroborate what I'm seeing in one is the same as the other, because if not, then I need to find out why. And as far as the information from one program to the other program, uh, were they corroborative of each other? Yes. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. I'm going to seek to introduce and admit. No objection. Okay. And one yes. statement. Uh, may I return to the witness room? Yes. And with the court's permission, may we publish it to the jury? Yes, with the lights on still? I think so. I think okay. it's Mr. starting with the first page that you have before you, um, first of all, do you recognize what's up on the screen as the first page of that next exhibit? Yes, sir. And uh, again, if you could, uh, using the laser pointer you have before you direct the jury's attention to what, if anything, of significance you observe in this first page of this next exhibit. Yes, uh, so I, again, this is from the Waze app. They're, they're tracked from 34 to 34 Bayview. Down Cedar Crest, again, returning back here. So that's just the bottom half. I just wanted to get a, a closer view of where the GPS plots were from Celebrate. And uh, the next slide, Mr. Gilman. And again, sir, if you could explain to the jury uh, what, what we're looking at in this particular slide. So the purple dots are the GPS points and the route taken. As I said, goes up to, I believe that's 51 uh, Fairview, excuse me, Cedar Crest, and then reverses back. And then this is the final point. It's right here. Uh, 34 Fairview is right here. There's a little yellow push pin on it. And again, sir, I'm sorry, just from the timing of the plotting of the points, the purple dots that you have there, if you could just... Uh, Using the laser pointer, direct the jury's attention to the app that Mr. O'Keefe's phone takes in reference. Uh, if I could ask you first, if you could just illustrate to the jury this particular uh, slide, where is 34 Fairview? Right here. And then if I could ask you with uh, the laser pointer to direct the jury's attention to the app that Mr. O'Keefe's phone in sequence, sort of how it travels and arrives at that location. Yep. Uh, as I've shown, goes down Cedar Crest, misses Fairview, goes up to here by the house with the pool turns around, comes back, takes a right onto Fairview, and then stops ultimately right in between 34 and 32 Fairview, uh, where the, I think there's like a flagpole and a fire hydrant right there. And Trooper Carino, directing your attention to this slide, uh, what are we looking at? Again, I cross-referenced it uh, with the points. This is uh, Maple, uh, excuse me, Pine Cone Road, and then Maplecroft intersects here. And this is the ascending, descending stairs point uh, in his phone. Um, doing a Google Earth elevation check. There's about a 20 degree dip and then it goes up and then as you go down Cedar Crest, the hill is about 50 foot elevation change again. So it's, it's pretty significant. And so I'm sorry, sir, as far as the elevation change that you're talking about, how is that measured and how, how and where is that in reference to what's depicted up here? So again, like I said, in this area here, there's about a 20 foot drop and then as you go down Cedar Crest, that hill, it's about 50 feet. Uh, this spot here is the ascending, descending stairs. So, as I said before, the he doesn't have an eye watch on, so it's not collecting that great health data. It's still acting as a pedometer. So, again, whatever movement he's doing is triggering something in the phone as he's ascending and descending these hills. Essentially, it could be tricking the phone into thinking it's stairs. Mr. Governor, if I could have the uh, next slide. 
uh, this timestamp is uh, 12, 19, 32 seconds. That's when the phone initially starts creating the GPS points uh, before Waze is activated uh, with 34 of you searched. So this looks to be the time Waze is actually opened up. So from the purple dots that are depicted on the screen as far as where is Mr. O'Keefe's phone at 12.19 a.m. in reference to 34 Fairview Road? 12.19 is right here. 34 Fairview is down all the way here. Number, you can't really see, but it's right in the bottom corner. And uh, the next slide, uh, Mr. This is the same map, but just minus the tracks, uh, the tracks uh, graphic. I'm sorry, Trooper, I lost track of what page we're on. Is there any other pages in that exhibit for you? No, that's the last one. May I approach this to retrieve your honor? Yes. Okay. All right. So, Ms. Tianetti, did that give you enough time? Oh, I, I had enough time. Yes. Okay. All right. So, Ms. McLaughlin, why don't I hear you just briefly, um, if you could frame this, or Ms. Delally, whoever wants to. Yes, sure. The Commonwealth is moving to introduce a Google search the defendant conducted at 1:27 p.m. on January 29th, 2022. The Commonwealth would argue that the probative value of this Google search outweighs any prejudice to the defendant. The search in question is at 1.27 p.m. before the defendant had spoken to law enforcement. She conducted a search for DUI attorneys. The Commonwealth thinks that this is appropriate for the jury to hear as it rebuts the Bowdoin defense that the defendant has laid out. Not that um, she did not intend to commit John O'Keefe. The defense has been that the defendant is essentially had what's been represented in open court was framed that she had um, no intent or opportunity to commit these crimes, uh, further that she was not intoxicated at the time. So the Commonwealth feels that the probative value significantly outweighs the prejudicial value. It goes to her state of mind at the time that the search was conducted. Further, it also rebuts that there was um, any impropriety in the police investigation or that as the defense has put it that the police did not search any or investigate any other potential culprits um, the it also would go to the defendant's consciousness of guilt at that time this statement is before she um, voluntarily gave an interview with law enforcement it goes to her state of mind prior to that interview um, and so for all those reasons the commonwealth would suggest that that google search is appropriate and it's not a typical case where it's an invocation of counsel, um, where law enforcement had not engaged her, and it goes to her state of mind at that time prior to any police involvement and further to rebut that there was any improprieties in the police involved investigation or that they should have investigated anyone else. All right, and I appreciate, Ms. Talali, you bringing this to our attention to give us time to look at it. Ms. McLaughlin, I appreciate that you provided a very strong limiting instruction uh, proposal. I'll hear you, Ms. Tianetti. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, you had asked that time that I produce proof of the phone call from Michael Clark to two Oh, I didn't say proof. No, I asked if that was coming into evidence. Okay, well, I'd like this mark for identification for the purpose of this argument, if I could. Sure. It's been redacted our attention to give us time to look at it. Ms. McLaughlin, I appreciate that you provided a very strong limiting instruction uh, proposal. I'll hear you, Ms. Tianetti. Thank you. you would ask oh, I didn't say proof. No, I asked if that was coming into evidence. Okay. Sure. It's been redacted. Okay. So let's have it marked for ID before I hear you any further. So Madam Court Reporter okay. needs to mark it. All right. And if I may have that. Thank you very much. Just give me a minute, Ms. Tianetti. All right, so this is just that a call occurred, right? Uh, that a call was made from Michael Proctor's personal cell phone number, you can see the last four digits there, to my client at 1.19 p.m. on January 29th, about okay. approximately eight minutes before she calls to uh, investigate a potential DUI attorney. Okay, so focus on the law for me and tell me why I should exclude this. Of course, with regard to the unpublished opinion that appears to have been a gun charge where the defendant in that case did a search for a nine millimeter handgun on his cell phone. He did not ask for Google or search in Google for a handgun attorney. Uh, he made a specific inculpatory search that the court ruled was relevant and it was not outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice. Um, in this case, uh, we have a, a person being contacted by the police and then doing what a citizen has every right to do, 
which is to look for an attorney for representation. There is zero probative value to that, other than she's presumed to be innocent, and she's seeking an attorney to defend that presumption of innocence. That's it. There's zero probative value. There is a stream and unfair prejudice in this case. Your Honor, the uh, limited instruction that the Commonwealth has uh, provided asks this court to instruct the jury whether her action in, in doing an internet search for an attorney indicates feelings of guilt by a defendant. I can't even believe that argument. So, so let, let's just focus on, on the oh, law. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, Your Honor. I'm, I'm right. So what, what I'm going to do then is, is I'm going to stop you. So on the balancing act that I have to do, I find that the probative value is I, is outweighed by the prejudicial okay. impact. All right, so uh, I'm not going to allow it in, Mr. Lally, in your case in chief. Now, if uh, you feel that through this witness or through any other witness, Mr. Lally, that it then is admissible, I just ask that you come to sidebar beforehand. Absolutely, Your Honor. Okay. All right, let's bring Trooper Garino back in, please. Trooper, if you have a bad back and you need to stand, just stand at any time. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Lally. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions for this witness, Your Honor.